Welcome, welcome. It is wonderful to have you with us today. I'm Tamar Gendler. And I am Dr. Lori Santos. And we are excited to be talking to you today about what the ancients got right about happiness. I think it is fantastic that so many of you are joining us on a beautiful summer day to talk about this topic of happiness, something that has been close to many of our hearts, especially recently during the context of this pandemic. But of course, this is also a topic that we are very interested in in non-pandemic times. You know, this is something that's literally written to the Declaration of Independence, you know, this pursuit of happiness. And we have exactly the right person here on screen with me today to help us think about happiness. Lori Santos is a professor of psychology here at Yale University. And she is the instructor of the largest course ever taught in Yale's history, a course called Psychology and the Good Life that when she taught it a few years ago had more than a quarter of Yale's students enrolled in it. And you can take the course yourself through Coursera, or you can listen to what it is that Lori has had to say about happiness through her extraordinary podcast, The Happiness Lab, which runs through Pushkin Industries. You can get it through podcast, and which has more than 40 million listeners who tune in regularly to hear what Lori has to say about happiness. And Tamar is, of course, as usual for my friend, being very modest here because at least one million of those downloads were for her episode on my podcast, The Happiness Lab, uh, talking about Plato and Aristotle. Tamar is also an expert in all of these big topics. Um, she was both the chair of the philosophy department here at Yale and the chair of the cognitive science program here at Yale. She is now the dean of the faculty of arts and sciences on campus. And when she's not uh, being a dean, she also teaches an incredibly popular class, the most popular at the time she taught it, um, called Philosophy and the Science of Human Nature, where the premise of the class is that they focused on human nature with a dead guy on Tuesday and the modern science on Thursday. And so you've got a team of folks here who are really thinking very carefully about this stuff. And tomorrow's class also is one that if you want to check it out, you can. It's available on Open Yale courses uh, online, so you can check it out. Um, but our goal today is to really dig into this topic of happiness, one that we think is so important in part because so many of us get it wrong. You know, we have these strong intuitions about what it would take to be happy. And oftentimes, even though we're following through on those intuitions, we seem to not be getting it right. We seem to be having incorrect ideas about what it means to be happier and what it means to flourish. And this was something that the ancients really picked up on. It wasn't just modern thinkers who realized we're getting it wrong. You know, these the folks have been thinking about happiness for thousands of years and realizing that we might not you know, have the right instincts, the right lay instincts about this stuff. And that's what ancient thinkers have talked about. And so that's what we're going to get into today. What are the problems with happiness? You know, what did the ancients think? And where are there spots where the kind of modern science sort of bearing out the old school tips that we have from the ancients? Um, just a quick run of show. We're probably going to chat for about a half hour, hopefully, although so Tamar is one of my best friends, and we sometimes finish each other's sentences, so it might be that we go on a little bit long. We'll see, but we're going to try to keep it to a half hour. Um, and while we're chatting, we really want you to be giving us your questions. And so, as you probably noticed, on the right side of your screen, there's a little box for you to stick your questions. Please be giving us tons and tons of these, because we really think the discussion will be most fun when we're answering your questions. But we'll chat for a half hour, and then answer some questions, uh, and we'll go from there. But we wanted to start, I think, with the most important place to start, which is if we're going to have a whole discussion about happiness and the kinds of ways that we can improve our happiness, we really need to start with what happiness is. Uh, and I know from teaching my class and from my podcast, that this is a spot where our lay intuitions can be worse. Often we think about happiness, we think happiness is like hot fudge sundays and orgasms and perfect circumstances and being rich and all this stuff. And it turns out what the science suggests is that those things don't necessarily work. And so I think this is a spot where we need the ancients to sort of help us out, to sort of give us a definition of happiness. And so Tamar, why don't you walk us through that? You know, was that, did the ancients think it was all hot fudge Sundays and orgasms or did they, you know, have a different concept of happiness? So in the ancient Greek tradition, you actually get a distinction between the sort of happiness that you might think of as orgasms and hot fudge Sundays, though they didn't have ice cream <laughs> and a, a different notion of happiness. And I think it's really useful to, to frame our conversation, at least at the beginning, in terms of the contrast between them. 
So you might think of the happiness that is the sort of local immediate pleasures of the body using the ancient term hedonism. It's an attempt to take pleasure in what is momentary and bodily and that feeds the part of ourselves that is not distinctively human about us, but is a part of ourselves that we share with all living beings. And of course, there's an important place for taking pleasure in the pleasures of the body. But in addition to having a notion of happiness that is hedonistic, that is, that describes the immediate pleasures, the ancient Greek tradition also has a notion, a richer notion of happiness, which is probably best translated as flourishing or thriving. And that term is eudaimonia. The term in the middle of that daimon refers to the soul or the spirit. And if you think of hedonism as happiness that imagines you're just a creature that exists at one moment and then another moment and then another moment, eudaimonia is a notion of happiness or flourishing or thriving that acknowledges the human status as a being extended in time, as a being capable both of instantaneous immediate pleasures that are available to you as a body and about extended richer pleasures that make use of your mental capacities, your emotional connections, your capacity for reason, the sorts of joys and pleasures that occur through your connection to what we sometimes call your higher self. And this is, I mean, I love this notion of eudaimonia in part because, you know, it maps onto what we often get wrong about happiness, which is this idea that we really aren't thinking about happiness at this one time point. We're thinking about happiness across time as an extended self, right? Um, you know, one of the reasons that hedonic happiness doesn't bring us happiness over time, beyond the fact that we might not be doing something to improve our moral selves and so on, is that even if you went straight just for pure hedonism, even if it was like hot fudge Sundays every moment, you know, we wouldn't get the same happiness hit from, you know, the, the second hot fudge Sunday, the third hot fudge Sunday, hot fudge Sundays in time, in part because of this psychological phenomenon of hedonic adaptation, the idea that we just get used to stuff over time. So even if your life is objectively good and you have objectively the best hedonic stuff over time, you kind of just don't get the same happiness hit from it over time. You know, this is one of the big things we know both from studies on lottery winners and from studies of people who are, are not in a good hedonic space. You know, the, the, the flip side of hedonic adaptation of getting used to the good stuff in life means that you also get used to the bad stuff in life, which is actually pretty good. And so, so I think the, this, this ancient notion of eudaimonia really fits with what the modern data is telling us, which is that it's not, happiness isn't about circumstances, it's really about um, something bigger. Yeah, I, I mean, the I, I like this image of hedonism as happiness for the sprint, eudaimonia as happiness for the marathon. And here we are extended through time. And though we adapt to momentary pleasures, the more times you have the hot fudge Sunday, it, it gives you progressively less pleasure with each repetition, you get used to it. One of the exceptional things about eudaimonistic pleasures, that is about these pleasures of a lifetime, is that their repeated engagement doesn't result in a diminishment of the experience of them. And so it's actually a nice way of distinguishing between these two notions of which the ancients have an intuitive sense. And we can then use the resources of the scientific and psychological research to say, yes, the distinction between them is a pleasure that dissipates with repeated engagement as opposed to a pleasure which stays steady or perhaps even increases with repeated engagement. So it, it, which raises an interesting question. The, the ancient traditions have all sorts of strategies for the cultivation of eudaimonia, of thriving, of flourishing. And I know in your course, you like to give your students sort of top three tips about the ways in which one might achieve this kind of lasting capacity to take joy in the world. And I wondered if you'd say something about what are those top three as you convey them in your class. 
Yeah, I'm happy to go through them with the caveat that, you know, we're, we're picking off three only because we have a half hour. If we had a longer, you know, a 26 lecture class, like our class version, we'd have 26. One, three, two. <laughs> but, the, but the top quick three, you know, for the listicle version of the top three, you know, is that if you if you want to achieve happiness from a scientific perspective, you have to focus on a couple of things. One are sort of specific behaviors that sort of connect you to your moment and sort of change your mindset and thinking specifically about first gratitude, um, this act of kind of appreciating and feeling thankful for what you have in life. The second is this act of being present or being mindful. Um, and then the third in my listicle would be a little bit different. They're you know, practices that really connect you to something else we know is really important for happiness, which is other people. And so that would be sort of the general act of socially connecting, being around other people, you know, getting to know other people and so on, but also doing things for other people, sort of random acts of kindness and so on. We know from so much empirical work that these are the kinds of things that really boost our happiness. In fact, random acts of kindness, buying things for other people, spending time on other people, we know actually makes you happy than buying things or spending things, spending time on yourself, right? And so, so that's my kind of list, of, again, you know, not the, the half hour version, Cliff Notes version of like all the things you need to do to be happy. Uh, you know, my top three would be gratitude, kind of presence and mindfulness, and then, you know, social connection richly construed. And so, you know, was this the same as the ancients listicle? You know, did they kind of come up with these three too? So, you know, I, a minute ago I was talking about the ancient Greek tradition. This is a nice chance to think about what it is that we get from some of the world's major religious traditions. And it's actually really nice. We can hang those three ideas of, of gratitude, mindfulness, and connection and service to others to three of the world's great religious traditions. So if you think about gratitude in connection to the Jewish ritual practice of basically saying a prayer that expresses gratitude prior to each action that you undertake, you really see a kind of depth to it. So one of the things the Jewish tradition asks you to do is each time you're about to consume food, you recite a blessing, thanking God for creating food that comes from, and then there is a set of possibilities. Is it food that grows from the earth? Is it food that grows from a tree? Is it food that comes from a vine? So you're really thinking about what is it about the world that allows me to gain sustenance from it? And at each moment of consumption, you proceed it with an expression of gratitude. Mindfulness is, of course, a key notion from the range of Buddhist traditions, each of which asks you to be profoundly attentive to the features of the particular moment in which you find yourself as a way of being wholly and fully present and receptive. And of course, the notion of connection to others through service to others is one of the most fundamental ideas of the Christian tradition, which asks you to think of yourself as a being in the world whose life gains meaning through what it is that you do and provide to others. So, so it seems like, you know, at the very basic level, I think my listicle would have been covered by the ancients. Um, but if, if that was the only problem we had for getting to happiness, we could all go off and be more grateful, be more mindful, you know, connect more socially, and we'd be great. But I think one of the problems with happiness is that it's elusive in part because some of the things we need to do to become happier, these things and even other things, we need to like actually kind of get, get over our desires, get over our lay intuitions about what we should be doing. So what do I mean by this, right? You know, I am like teach this class on happiness. I know that I would be happier if I was really richly socially connecting with other people. But, you know, when I'm waiting around, you know, in some waiting room or on a subway or something, I don't often talk to the people around me. I pick up my phone and look at something dumb on Reddit. You know, I know I would be much happier if I engaged in practices that allowed me to be more mindful, things like meditation and so on. But when the alarm goes off in the morning, even though I know I'm supposed to do my 10 minutes of meditation, I kind of don't want to do it, right? Like these things are the kinds of behaviors that are going to boost our happiness, but they also seem to be ones that require, you know, regulating desires for other stuff. Like it, it's kind of, we reflectively can know that we want to go after these things, but kind of in terms of our basic desires and our basic behaviors, it seems it's not easy. And I feel like 
but this is kind of a dumb feature of the mind. Like this is a, an odd and strange feature of human nature, but it's a strange feature of human nature that really was something that the ancients remarked on a lot, right? Yeah, in fact, one of the things that you find literally in every wisdom tradition is the representation of human beings as internally complex. So the Greek philosopher Plato, who lived about 2,500 years ago, famously says that the inside of a human being is like a charioteer guiding two horses. And one of the horses is basically interested in ice cream sundaes and orgasms, that is in food and sex and the things that are giving you procreation. And the other horse is interested basically in social approbation. And then there's this charioteer who's the rational reflective self who's trying to keep these horses in line. The Buddhist tradition has a similar metaphor of a big messy elephant that's running off in all sorts of directions and a poor rider who's trying to pull it in particular directions. Or you have in the contemporary version, Oprah talking about your head and your heart. <laughs> or you it's, good that, it's good that Oprah catches up with yeah, like- that's Oprah, Oprah, Oprah's <laughs> really giving right that the head and the heart are, are analogs to this Buddhist tradition of the rider and the elephant. Or you get system one and system two for those who have read the work of Kahneman and Tversky. And of course, all this is totally unsurprising. Our brains are unbelievably complex organisms and different parts of it are assigned the task of processing different sorts of information. Our visual system is taking in one thing. We have systems that are responding to emotions. We have systems that are responding to internal features of our bodies. We have a very small part at the front, basically the charioteer that is it's the prefrontal cortex that is trying to keep all of these parts in line. So it's part of what self-reflection brings and part of what the scientific research regarding the structure of the brain brings is this common story, which is it is inevitable for beings structured like us that we will experience ourselves as being pulled in different directions. And this seems to be true at a really broad sense. You know, you mentioned sort of system one and system two. I think neurally people tend to, you know, at a very gross level, sort of thinking of that as sort of areas of the brain that exert sort of self-regulation, you know, frontal cortex kind of controlling other parts of our brains and our desires. But, you know, even if you kind of dig into the neuroscience even more, what you find are these, again, these interesting tensions. And so one of my favorite tensions, I know you've heard me talk about this a lot tomorrow, so like you block your ears as I tell everyone else, is what I think is like the dumbest feature of the human brain, which is that our wanting system, the system that causes us to like desire stuff and experience pleasure from stuff and so on, it is not a uniform system, right? There's a lot of work showing that one part of our brain that sort of experiences rewards the sort of so-called mesolimbic dopamine system. It's, first of all, it's really tiny, right? You might expect that we experience like sensory pleasures all over the brain, but we do so in just a little teeny, teeny, tiny part. And that part, which kind of regulates our liking for things and regulates our wanting for things, tends to do so in a relatively automatic way. This is what dopamine, the dopamine system seems to do, is it kind of makes us want stuff in a very kind of automatic-y, sort of craving-y way. But sometimes this dopamine system goes rogue. Sometimes it ends up making us want stuff, you know, this horse that's running off in this direction that reflectively, cognitively, I'm like, what is going on? We don't want this at all, right? You know, this is, you know, most true in the case of say drug addiction or something like that, of a drug user who reflectively really wants to quit but has this incredible craving for stuff. But, you know, it's true for me for my phone or checking Twitter when I'm supposed to, when I reflectively want to be working on a paper or something like that. So that's like dumb part number one. But then if you look at my cognitive reflection, I have these very cognitive reflective wants. You know, I want to be happy. I want world peace. You know, I want to finish this hard paper or this grant I'm working on. But I don't have any automatic structure that's get, causing me craving, you know, the same craving I would have for a drug or like a cookie that was sitting on the table. And so these are these like two dumb features of the way our wanting is organized. We have this like incredible craving, this super strong horse that's like running in this direction that might not be going after anything that we really want. And then we have, you know, this rider who really wants to go somewhere like, and he doesn't really have a mechanism for kind of automatically getting us to go after stuff. And I think this is a really dumb thing, right? You know, it, it just sucks that we have brains, that our nature is designed such 
that we have these kind of different modes of wanting and that we can't necessarily push our wanting always in the direction or that it takes work to kind of push our wanting in the right direction. But this yet again was another spot where I think the ancients thought really critically about this, right? Like how can we regulate our desires? How can we get our kind of wantings to line up well? And what are some strategies for doing that? Yeah, so there's a fantastic story in Homer's Odyssey, which is this incredible poetic saga of a man who's trying to get home from the Trojan War named Odysseus. And, and the Odyssey is the story of his journey home. And one of the episodes in this story is a time when he's steering his boat through a narrow channel where it's, there's this beautiful singing by these beautiful creatures called sirens. And most people who steer the boat past the sirens are tempted, right? This is like the horse pulling. This is like the craving. This is like the desire to steer their boat into the rocky shore instead of moving forward towards their longer term goal. So it's exactly the structure that you're describing where it's very easy to be tempted by the local momentary pleasure and really difficult to figure out how it is that you can create in yourself enough incentive to get past the point. And what's fascinating is that in the story, Homer describes the two strategies that you can take to get past these sirens. So the first is that the oarsmen, the men rowing the ship, block their ears with wax. So they basically reduce the strength of the temptation. It's like rather than having the chocolate cake right in front of you, appealing to you at every moment, you put it in a location so that it's far away, so that its sensory assault on you isn't as clean as it would have been otherwise. Ulysses, meanwhile, wants to hear the force of the desires, but he wants to prevent himself from acting on it. And so what he does, Ulysses is an, the Roman name for Odysseus, is he ties himself to the mast so he can hear the tempting sounds, but he renders himself unable to act on it. So one of the strategies is to think about what are the ways, if there are these things that you know in advance are likely to be tempting, that you can reduce the power of the temptation, or if you want to indulge in the complicated pleasure of hearing a temptation but not acting on it, how can you pre-commit yourself in such a way that you restrict your activity so that even at the moment that you really want to do the thing, you've rendered yourself unable to do it? And this is critical for, you know, half the healthy habits that we want to engage in life, right? Like I know I'm probably going to be happier if I get up and exercise in the morning. I know I'm going to be happier if I you know, write in my gratitude journal or whatever, but there are tempting things that block me from doing that, right? We can steal these Odyssean strategies to kind of get towards these things. I mean, in a way you can think about these Odyssean strategies as like, these external things that we put into place, you know, move your move the cookies out of the way, you know, put something like really convenient. We can do that sort of thing to use our external situation to regulate our desire. Um, but another external situation that I use a lot to regulate my desires, Navarro, you know this because you're my friend, is that we can use the people around us to do that. You know, so when I want to engage in healthier habits or if I'm in a bad zone, I often like want to be hanging out with you so that we can like connect with one another, kind of experience these other each other's emotions, but also experience each other's behaviors, right? And this was also something that was like really central in the ancient traditions as well, right? Yeah, I mean, in fact, Aristotle has this notion of a friend as what he calls a second self. And the idea is that you double your joy and half your sadness by having companionship alongside you. And you might think of religious traditions and rituals as being another version of this. What they say is, if you are in a situation where you want to respond to your longer term desire and not to the momentary temptation, you can help yourself to do so by a companion who shares with you your commitment. And at the moment where you are feeling a lack of fortitude, they can sustain you and vice versa. 
which is awesome to be talking about this with my friend Tamar because I know she does this for me all the time and sort of vice versa. Um, but another thing that Tamar helps me out a lot with is not trying to figure out ways to regulate my desires externally, but kind of giving good tips for helping to regulate these desires internally by like changing our mindsets. This isn't like Odysseus' strategy of like tie yourself up or change something in the environment. It's change something within you. And this seems to be like a spot where like we can actually do this pretty well through changing our habits. Something else that Aristotle, the same person who realized the power of friends could actually think was really important too, right? Yeah, Aristotle uses this wonderful analogy. He talks about how is it that you learn to play the harp? And he says, you become a harpist by playing the harp. That is, you engage in the activity that you want to have become natural to you. And if you practice it enough, it becomes not a second self, but second nature. It becomes what you do routinely. So he notices that if you want to become courageous, you practice acting courageously until it becomes your instinctive response. And this is, of course, exploiting what it is that we earlier said about the brain, which is a whole bunch of us is part of what we share with non-human animals. And just as you can train your dog that if you throw a stick, it goes and fetches it, or if you make a particular sound, it sits down or stands up, you can train the non, you can train the parts of your brain over which you don't have direct control to respond habitually and instinctively in the ways that you want them to. And, and the way sometimes it makes sense to summarize Aristotle is that what Aristotle is basically saying to you is act as if you were already the thing that you want to become. And if you do that often enough, that is what you will find yourself being. It's a sort of fake it till you make it, but in Greek. And the psychologist Wendy Wood actually has a wonderful book about the nature of habit, tracing it all the way back to the ancient tradition and thinking a lot about the contemporary literature. And so, so those are ways to kind of, you know, get your desires in line with what you want to do reflectively, both with the external world and with the internal world. Um, for our last tip that we want to give before we turn to questions, I think it's also worth discussing kind of what happens when all of that falls apart. You know, when it's just, you know, you're just stuck with a desire that's there, something you want that you can't get, or just you're just stuck with a negative emotion generally. You know, because like, you know, let's face it, you know, poop is going to happen, you know, not to use the words of the great ancients, but you know, to like use some, I don't know, bad emoji or something like that. And so the last question is, you know, what are strategies that we can use to just kind of acknowledge the reality of things sucking and kind of get through it anyway? Yes, yeah, so, so one of the traditions that really addresses this is what's sometimes called the tradition of Stoicism. And there's a modern interpretation of it which says like, Stoicism is just sitting through the pain without giving in to the pain. But in fact, the Stoic tradition offers in one of the great popular versions of it, a, a philosopher named Epictetus, a whole bunch of particular self-help strategies. So you are feeling suffering and he asks you to reframe it, to imagine that it's happening to someone else, to imagine that you just need to get through the next 30 seconds of it, and then the next 30 seconds, and the next 30 seconds. So it acknowledges the reality of negative emotions. It doesn't say they're not happening but it gives particular strategies for reframing them so that they don't feel like they are fully absorptive of the self. And that's wonderful because it also like fits with a different, you know, more kind of Eastern tradition that also deals with the fact that, you know, life sucks and those things are there, which is sort of, you know, a Buddhist way of dealing with traditions, right? You know, Buddhists like talk about dukkha, this idea of suffering. That's like one of the first noble truths, like suffering is going to happen. But the tool and the practice that Buddhists give us is this tool of kind of mindful acceptance, kind of non-judgmentally just allowing the present moment to be just as it is, right? This is the kind of thing that takes some work, right? You know, these are meditation and allowance practices that really are practices. 
But the modern science is now showing that these ancient tools work really, really well. In fact, our colleague, uh, Hedy Kober, who's a, a psychiatrist and neuroscientist at Yale, she actually studies this process of mindful acceptance, how this works in the brain. And what she finds is that like the act of kind of mindfully just allowing your desire to be there, or your negative emotion to be there, can actually shut off the neural mechanisms that are causing it. So for example, if I'm experiencing a craving for say a cigarette or a piece of food, if I just allow myself to mindfully be with that craving, it's gonna kind of work like an urge and sort of, I can kind of surf it and it'll go down, but these, it just doesn't go down in terms of my experience of it. You actually see less neural firing in these reward regions um, that would be causing the craving in the first place. So these ancient traditions of just saying, hey, you know, if you wind up with this, these negative emotions or these kind of desires that you can't fulfill, you can also reframe them and even just allow them to kind of get through them. Um, and so, you know, so those are some of the strategies we wanted to get to. I'm watching so many quiet questions come in through uh, Squiddo. And so I think we should probably switch over and kind of answer um, some of these. Uh, and one of the ones that caught my eye because I find it uh, interesting for the, again, another spot where I think our mind doesn't do us really a great service is this one, which is, um, how would you place the importance and impact of self-awareness strategies, things like journaling, um, in order to deal well with our irrational selves? And the reason I like this question in particular, Tamar, is that it seems to uh, harness this concept that you and I actually wrote together about. In fact, I think the only paper that we've actually published together um, about you know, the, the parts of our awareness that are good and when there are spots where awareness can let us down. Um, do you want to introduce this idea of the fallacy that we came up with together? Yeah, so so the we, we gave it a sort of funny name, which is we called it the G.I. Joe fallacy. G.I. Joe was a character in some early children's television shows. And, and so I wasn't as much of a child of the 80s as I was. Those of you who are children of 80s know G.I. Joe, terrible cartoon, really cheesy. I'm uh, just, you know, defending our use of the G.I. Joe title. The punchline of it is, and now you know, and knowing is half the battle. And the basic idea is, if you're aware of something with the conscious, rational part of yourself, you know but knowing is only half the battle. In fact, it's probably less than half the battle. The, what you need is the capacity to engage with the idea, with what it is that's capturing your attention in ways that make use of the other parts of yourself. Yeah, and I think, you know, to get to this question, you know, the, I think that specific question asked about things like journaling and so on, I think these techniques are fantastic for giving you some awareness of two things. One is awareness of you know, your desires, your emotions, all these things, maybe even some awareness of what your reflective self really wants. You know, I think we need kind of space and journaling can give us that space to figure that out. But just knowing what your reflective self wants doesn't immediately turn it into the automatic kind of wanting that means you're naturally gonna engage in the behaviors that get it. And this is what gets to some of the strategies we were just talking about. This is a spot where you might need to regulate your environment in the ways we were talking about to get those strategies better. Maybe your reflective self, when you journal, you realize, ah, I need to do something to deal with the fact that I'm griping all the time and you know complaining to my teammates at work or something. That might be a spot where you're like, oh, reflectively, you need to build in that gratitude practice, right? You might reflectively recognize like, oh, this is a spot where, you know, I really am just like so distracted and I have all these temptations. Ah, you know, that's when you steal those Odyssean strategies we were talking about, about getting rid of some of those temptations. But the key is that the reflection only gets you so far. You have the realization, but you haven't won the battle yet in the terms of G.I. Joe. You really still need to put in the work to kind of get a little bit further. And, and what know. it lets you notice are what are the patterns where the rational reflection isn't sufficient? What are the patterns where I actually need to make use of these other tactics and strategies? What are the places where I either need to reduce the force of the temptation, tie myself to the mask, surround myself by friends and rituals, or engage in these practices of distancing and mindfulness? And there's a question that has come in, how do we reconcile the Buddhist notion of happiness only existing in the present moment with the notion of eudaimonia as a self extended in time. And that actually, I think, gives us a chance to give a slightly more subtle reading of what's wrong with hedonism. Mm -hmm. So, what's wrong with hedonism 
is that it attempts to solve the problems of an extended self by treating that self as if it were only momentary. That is, the hedonist ignores the fact that if you are not fully absorbed in the moment, which you are not if you're not engaged in the sort of mindful practice that the Buddhist tradition asks, if you are actually engaging in the moment in a way that implicitly compares it to other moments, which is what hedonic adaptation shows us to be doing, then you will experience this decline of pleasure. So basically, you can think of there being two good choices and one bad one. One good choice is to be fully absorbed in each moment. That's actually a really powerful way of being an extended self. It's fully present now and fully present now and fully present now. Or you can be an extended self that thinks of its capacities and strengths as accumulating over time. That's what we are thinking of when we're talking about the eudaimonistic self. The mistake of the hedonistic self is to think that you can be partially present in a moment and have it be as if it were new. So it's got a fact of extendedness with a practice of momentariness. And you need the fact and the practice to align. Yeah, and I think, you know, another way to think about this is that, you know, there there really is something in the Buddhist notion of the way that you're present in those moments. So I think you're allowing yourself to be, be present, be present. So you can be an extended self where you're present across time, but it's really also being present in a particular kind of way, which is this way of sort of non-judgmental acceptance. So you've talked about the attention part, but there's also the sort of intention part, which is to kind of be in the present moment, not seeking, not going around things and so on. And I think when you're not caught up in your own suffering, when you're not caught up in your own desires, that can really allow you the sort of reflective access to figure out what are the kinds of things that you need to get to a higher moral purpose? You know, the kind of way that I think Aristotle really thought of this eudaimonia with the like daimon, the daimon part, which is really about your soul and sort of building these things up. You know, if you can non-judgmentally accept the present moment, then you can have a kind of contentment from which you can kind of achieve other sorts of moral goods too. So I think there's a sort of connection there as well. Um, sorry, I'm now scrolling through more questions here. Um, here was another one that I thought was very uh, kind of interesting, a little bit morbid, but you know, we, we can go there. Um, what can the ancients tell us about finding happiness in the face of death? Um, this was actually something that I think the Stoics talked about a lot, right? That they, they the Stoics really thought you should think about your own death. They had this idea of primaditatio mortem, right? Like you should really think about not just like, hey, I'm gonna die, but also, you know, my husband might leave me, I might lose my job, I might break my knee. Like the Stoics really thought that you should engage in a process of what they referred to as negative visualization, right? You should take some time to meditate on all the bad things that could happen to you. And the reason they thought this gets back to, you know, one of my top three, you know, happiness tips that I think are really powerful, which is this idea of gratitude. Oddly enough, this act of thinking about the fact that, you know, you might die, about the fact that these bad things might happen, it can give you a little bit of gratitude for the fact that the counterfactual is true right now. Like, I am not dead. <laughs> like, my knee is not broken. My husband, at least, you know, he's somewhere right now, hopefully, but he has not left me that I know of, right? Like, these are good things in my life that I can enjoy right now. And so I think the Stoics were really into the kind of morbid, the sort of premeditatio mortem, in part because they wanted to get us to, to use that negative visualization to think about the good stuff. And, you know, it can be hard to be grateful, you know, against these counterfactuals that are out there. It can be hard to be grateful for the things we have because the things we have, you know, are annoying sometimes or whatever. But like, if we really think about the good parts of them, we can remember the good of them. One of the practices I use sometimes when I'm giving talks um, for people who have kids and want to like re-experience the gratitude they have for their kids is to just do that quick negative visualization as suggested by the Stoics. You know, the last time you saw your kids, if you have kids out there, that was the last time you're ever going to see them. They're gone, right? And <gasps> watch the clutch in your chest. And if you really had thought about that, my guess is the next time you see your kids, you're going to hug them a little bit more closely. You know, even if they left a bunch of crap all over the floor, did something stupid, you're not going to think about that. You're just going to be incredibly grateful 
that they're still there. That is negative visualization. It's the power of getting this other reference point that makes you feel really grateful that you don't actually have to do. You can kind of just imagine it, which I think is really nice because we don't necessarily want to break our knees or have our spouses leave us and so on. We really you know, want to get the benefit of that counterfactual without having going through it. And the Stoics have figured out this incredibly clever way to do that, which I love. So. And they also give strategies for dealing with genuine pain and suffering. So they do describe not just what it would be to engage in negative visualization and experience the contrastive effect of what hasn't happened. Sometimes enormously difficult things do happen. And one of the strategies they give there is distancing. That is, imagine that it had happened not to you, but to someone else which can reduce the pain, interestingly, in two different ways. One is by making it feel like it's not yours, and that reduces the pain. The other is by making it feel like it is a common characteristic experienced by many. That is, it gives you, in some version, the kind of commonality of the friendship experience. But sometimes things really are genuinely and truly painful. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) There's just bad stuff. Allowing yourself to fully feel and experience that, to acknowledge that one of the things the Stoics say is if you're going to go to the baths, imagine and remember that when you get there, you will be jostled. If you're going to love someone at some point, the loving of them will bring with it an experience of loss. And the recognition that the more powerful the loss, the more powerful the love was, is a way of combining the negative visualization with the realization that, yes, life does bring with it certain forms of suffering, And recognizing that the more powerful the suffering, the more profound the connection was that gave rise to it is one of the Stoic insights. Yeah, and it's very similar to something else you get out of the Buddhist tradition, which is this idea of the second arrow, right? You know, the Stoics really thought, look, there's the bad thing that happens to you. And then there's a thing that you can control, which is your reaction to it, right? And they had all these practices like the baths of like, hey, imagine what's going to happen to you so you can help control your reaction to it. But the uh, the the second arrow uh, metaphor, which comes from the Buddhist tradition, is this idea that, you know, if you're walking down the street and you get hit with an arrow, that sucks. But if you got hit with a second arrow, that would be even worse. And the Buddha goes on to say, you know, the first arrow in life we can't control. That's the, you know, bad stuff happens, right? The poop happens. But the second arrow in life is usually us. It's usually us stabbing ourselves and the reaction we have and the mean email I send afterwards and the fact that I ruminate for three days after it happens. And the Buddhists point out, like, that's on you, right? Like, no matter what bad stuff happens, you can kind of control your reaction to it. And I really do love this because we don't even just get that you can do it. You know, we're getting all these fantastic strategies that we can use to regulate this stuff, which is great. And, and the Stoic so- tradition, as you know, says exactly the same thing. It says some things are up to us, some things are not up to us. What's not up to us is what other people do and say and think. What is up to us is our interpretation of it. No one can insult you unless you interpret their behavior as having been an instance of an insult. So what is up to you is your mental state. And what we learn from some of the things we've discussed earlier is that there's lots of tools and strategies that we have for getting our mental state into the place that we want it to be. And those include participating in rituals that give meaning to our lives and the experience of being deeply and profoundly connected to friends who share our values and ideas, like the one who is on the screen. What a, what a touching, nice way to end. Um, I, we hope that we've kind of whet your appetite for kind of learning more about what the ancients thought about uh, how you can flourish a little bit more, how you can be happier. If you want to learn more, you should check out Tamar's fantastic course, Philosophy and the Science of Human Nature, which you can get completely for free if you Google Open Yell Courses. Um, and Lori's Coursera course, which is called Psychology and the Good Life and gives you a great number of tips, way more than three, for yeah. happiness and thriving. 
Yeah, so if you like the Cliff Notes, we encourage you to you know, get your real Yale education later on. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. This has been fabulous and thank you so much for your questions. We hope that you will continue to stay safe and stay happy. Thanks so much to all. Stay safe, stay well.